Welcome back to Saturday University. Uh, to our second speaker, who is uh, Dr. Anne Alexander. Now, we often think of healthcare in terms of doctors and nurses treating diseases and helping patients, or we think of it in terms of costs, usually rising costs. Uh, but both concerns are part of a larger web, a web which draws together the health of individuals and families, the impact of illnesses on businesses, the health, and not just their costs, for health insurance, but their ability to carry out their work. It also impacts the availability of health care providers, the government role in care, access, affordability, and payment, and of course, government regulations against fraud and quackery. And then there's just plain old human behavior, both predictable and unexpected. Anne Alexander is not a doctor. She is an economist, and she brings an ecological economic perspectives to bear on these matters. Uh, Anne is one of UW's own. She has earned her PhD from our Department of Economics and Finance, which in environmental economics is one of the top ranked uh, departments in the world. And Anne uses this environmental approach to understand the connectedness of all these facets of problems in healthcare, health uh, providing and uh, the payment thereof. And she looks at how changes at the, at one end of this interconnectedness affects uh, and causes changes in the other end. Uh, during her education at UW and afterwards, Anne has earned a, a teaching award from the College of Business and she's received UW's top teaching prize, which we, prefer, we refer to uh, on campus as an L. Bogan. Uh, she served as assistant dean for the College of Business, and in 2002 and 2003, she was the American Association for the Advancement of Science Diplomacy Fellow in Washington, D.C., where she worked for the State Department uh, in the analysis of African affairs. Anne is now a faculty member in the Department of Economics and Finance, and she also directs our International Programs Division where she guides UW's growing activities in international student education and travel. And today, Anne is going to bring all of that together and speak to us on what does health care reform mean for Wyoming, health exchanges, Medicaid, and provider challenges. Dr. Alexander. presentation, Dr. Sandine. I'm going to uh, be probably a little bit, as my colleague Jim King pointed out, this is the dismal science economics is. <laughs> and anybody who's ever seen me talk before, I try to end with pictures of cute puppies because generally speaking, we <laughs> earned our reputation for a good reason. No, I, I, but, but what I wanted to do today was talk a little bit about uh, how Wyoming has a slightly different environment when it comes to health care reform. There has been uh, a lot, shall we say, of yelling about which, which way we should reform health care uh, for a long time. Teddy Roosevelt was the first American president that tried to reform the health care system. And a part of the reason that it has been so difficult for so long uh, for anybody to agree on this is because, first of all, in public policy, they're politicians. And, and so it's their job to disagree with each other, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> And, and secondly, because our system isn't a market, it isn't a, it isn't a, a comprehensive, you know, sort of place where, like Walmart, where you go and, and get insurance and healthcare. Uh, those two things are separate, by the way. Insurance is completely separate from the provision of healthcare, which is something I want to talk a little bit about for Wyoming today. But the other thing is that it's a patchwork. So after World War II, since just following very nicely onto Dr. Sandine's talk, uh, after World War II, as all of our veterans were returning, we had a real issue with the fact that we probably didn't have enough jobs for all of them. And we were going to have to cut back on military spending, we were going to have to figure out how to pay for the debt on military spending. And so um, a lot of employers were implored by the federal government to please, please, please hire veterans as they're coming back because that did not happen after World War I. And the, the employers, the private sector employers in our country were happy to do so but could not afford to pay them very much. Um, and so what thus 
started. Uh, one of the most wonderful uh, systems of healthcare in the world as far as health outcomes go. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, instead of paying more wages to these veterans, they started offering them wages and benefits. Retirement packages and health care, right? And so, so this thus began the, the tangled web of the system that we have for insurance coverage. Um, so we started having employer-sponsored health care, followed a few decades later by Medicare and Medicaid, uh, and various other systems that have come online over the years. The Indian Health Service, the uh, veterans and other military kinds of uh, provision, public employees, health systems, the, the list goes on and on. So that's insurance. Insurance is very, we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. Don't worry, that's later. It's, it's not nearly as fun as the fact that, yeah, that's great. We reform this massive system of healthcare with, with some laws a couple of years ago. Uh, recently upheld in, in most of its uh, entirety by the Supreme Court, but there still is a simple fact in Wyoming that we can't ignore. Whether or not we insure the 90,000 people in the state that are currently uninsured, um, there's still a small problem in it. How many of you are medical professionals in here? Aha, yes, and look at how small in number they are. And they're probably overrepresented here because I'm talking about healthcare. Um, and so, uh, so we don't have very many doctors, right? Because we don't have very many people, for one thing, and we're all kind of spread out all over the place. But it's, it's even more, here, I'll just summarize it with a, a table or a map. This is a map, oh, now, okay. You're gonna have to lean a little bit because really Wyoming is kind of, it does kind of lean on a map, really. We just don't realize that. <laughs> so, so this, this, this. And it's leading to it. <laughs> I am pleased. And so, so here's, that's hilarious. I didn't even notice that. So half of these photos are going to be, or not photos, these maps are going to be leaning to the right. Some of them are just going to be the square thing that we're used to. But, so this is Nebraska, there's South Dakota, Colorado, and so on, all of our neighbors. But this is, um, by the reckoning of the um, Health and Human Services Department, the frontier counties of Wyoming. And frontier means exactly what it sounds like. There are, we'll talk about some other delineations that they call us uh, with provider shortages and medically underserved populations. But these are, these are the places where it is most difficult to provide health care, be, simply because the number of providers, particularly in internal medicine and general practice, but also in geriatrics and OBGYN, which are our four highest need areas, that's where we don't have enough. We have sparse and or um, dispersed population, and the provider numbers are not there. Uh, the, the, the counties that are not included <laughs> are the easiest ones to name because it's pretty much everybody. But Natrona County, most of Albany County, most some of uh, Laramie County, Johnson and Sheridan County, and Uinta. And Uinta only because they're close to Utah, seriously. <laughs> They don't have enough doctors either. But everywhere else in the state has what's considered a frontier health economy. And so they don't think we ride in Conestoga wagons, but they do know that it's very difficult for us to get to doctors. So when we, when we talk about health insurance reform, which is what the health care reform bill really was about, we have to remember that the decision makers in our state are also facing this. If I can pay for it, but I live in the middle of uh, Park County and I can't get to a doctor because I don't live close to Cody and the roads are closed a lot, um, well, it doesn't matter if I can pay for it if I can't get it, right? So accessibility is kind of the, the other issue. Um, I already kind of alluded to this, but we have, um, we have a very high need across the state for primary care, geriatrics, and OBGYN. Primary care uh, with, with general practitioners and internal medicine is, generally speaking, across the whole country a, a big problem in the sense that we need a lot more of it than we have, but they are paid very well, particularly relative to the specialties. Geriatrics we are seeing a growing need for because um, the population of Wyoming is growing at about the fourth highest rate, or sorry, aging, not growing, you all went, what? Uh, no, <laughs> aging at the fourth highest rate in the country. And so we are going to need 
it, geriatrics to me brings brings to mind something uh, something maybe that it, it shouldn't, which is for extremely elderly patients. But actually, geriatrics just means uh, caring for people who are over 65, and so we are going to have an increasing need for that across the country, but also particularly in Wyoming. OBGYN is a continuous shortage for the state, and in fact, even down in the, uh, in the, great, uh, the great civilized county of Laramie, um, where we have a giant hospital, we still don't have, well, everybody goes to Fort Collins for, their, um, for when they're gonna have a baby. So, there you go. This is kind of a, this is, some of these are nationwide trends, but they're particularly acute in the state. Um, refining this down a little bit more, not only are we a frontier, <laughs> we're a frontier state, but we also have uh, numerous kinds of what are called, as you can see here, health professional shortage areas, HPSAs. And these are designated by this, this piece of uh, the Health and Human Services Department as having a shortage of one of these categories. We are acutely short of mental care providers in the state. Um, 23 of 23 counties, uh, or pieces of all of the counties. Dental in, um, I believe, 13 subdivisions, not necessarily full counties, but parts of counties. And primary care, 18 of our 23 counties, or some subdivision of a county. So we do, and I'll show you where those are in just a second. You'll have to tilt your head again for, for a moment. The other, um, the other uh, challenge that our providers face, that our populations also face, is that we have another designation called uh, medically underserved populations. Um, these are areas that are designated, again, by that piece of HHS as having too few primary care providers, high infant mortality, high poverty, and or a high elderly population. So those things all compounded and mixed together. Um, it, it, they're actually, well, you'll see, you'll see how many of us fit this, how many of our counties fit this designation in just a second. But um, essentially, in many states, um, there are some medically underserved populations. So I can't think of a state that doesn't have one. Um, many times they're in urban areas. Um, but in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, uh, in Utah, in South Dakota, North Dakota in particular, uh, there are large swaths of the population that are designated as medically underserved populations. So there's our rural health classification. We're classified as rural health area. Uh, you can see that is pretty much the entire state of Wyoming, um, except for this nice little piece right down here that's called Cheyenne and that nice little piece up there that's called Casper. Um, but this is the rural health designation. So we're frontier, we have rural health designation, um, and there are some little stars and diamonds on here that, that show uh, maternal health centers, primary health care centers, rural health centers. And the reason that we get these designations as a state, the reason we actually look for them and ask for them, is so we can ask for resources from the Health and Human Services Department to set up um, HIV AIDS service centers, maternal and child health service centers, and so on. So this is actually, that's why we, that's why we, we don't like being this, but it's certainly good to have those resources. Primary, um, having a primary shortage area, primary care shortage area, you, you want to know exactly what that means. Well, it means that we got very few doctors. <laughs> so the population ratio, there's a, you know, these are government regulations, there's lots and lots of numbers, but essentially what it says is you have to have a ratio of one physician for every 3,500 people or, or more. Um, it, but it has to be greater, <laughs> it has to be between 3,500 and 3,000 um, and have high, un unusually high needs for primary care services or insufficient, insufficient capacity of existing primary care providers. And then you also have to show that people or primary care providers in other areas that are next to you are not, are not they're either too hard to get to or they're too busy. So you can't get to Salt Lake City, you can't get to Fort Collins, you can't, to get, you can't get to one of these areas. And so you have to have, I mean, that's a real, that's really critical. But you can see easily there by this definition why Wyoming has um, that designation in a lot of our counties. A dental care, HPSA, well, it's a little bit, you know, we work the dentist harder. So ha they have to serve 5,000 people or less, um, <laughs> or, or, they, or, or we're a shortage area. So 
Um, there's a couple of different designations there. You either have to have at least this ratio of 5,000 to 1, or a population of full-time equivalent doctors of less than 5,001, but greater than 4,001. And then again, the dentists around you can't be, over, can't be reachable very easily, and they can't be overutilized. So that's a dental. The mental health, oh, this is just, just glance over it. It's a long, long, horribly long and complicated thing, but basically they break it, the only thing that's really important here, I'm sorry if you're a psychiatrist, I sound like I'm like, well, oh, you're not important. You are, but there are so many different permutations here. Essentially, they break it down into mental health professionals and psycho or, sorry, psychiatrists. So you have to have some combination of a shortage of generally mental health professionals and psychiatrists, okay? And again, mental health professionals in contiguous areas are overutilized, excessively distant, or inaccessible to residents in the area under consideration. So you have to have, and these are even, most of them are much bigger numbers even than the primary care as far as being designated as a mental health shortage area. Um, the reason that this can present a serious problem for Wyoming is if you think about the fact that in a lot of towns, even in Jackson and Laramie, if, um, if you've lived there long enough um, and you are, your car is at the one and only mental health or behavioral health kind of center in the entire you know, county, everybody knows you're there, right? And that can be a deterrent to people seeking mental health um, assistance. It really can be. And so this is one of the most uh, worrying of all of them as far as people not seeking treatment. Going to your doctor's office is not terribly stigmatized. It's still the case that going to a mental health professional can be stigmatized, particularly in smaller towns. So this can be a real problem. So these are the numbers. We have um, 18 geographic county areas that are primary care shortage areas and 19 sub-county areas, so parts of 19 counties. Um, dental, we have one that is pure, one county that's purely um, a dental shortage area, but um, 11 sub-counties, so parts of counties, and then 12 areas that have low-income populations that have a difficult time paying for dental care. Mental health, every one of our counties are considered shortage areas. So, and here's the map, so you can see where everybody is that has these, these difficulties. So this one is nice and straight, no tilt. And in this particular case, what we're looking at is the primary care HPSAs. And what you can see there is that parts of some counties, like Park and uh, Sheridan, part of, uh, part of uh, let's see, Platt, part of, part of Natrona, and part of Campbell County, part of Fremont County, part of Park County, and part of Lincoln County are considered primary care shortage areas. And then full counties like Bighorn and, uh, well, I guess part of Laramie County, Carbon, Sweetwater, Lincoln, or sorry, Uinta, Sublet, and so on. So all across there, up there, I'm sorry, I, I apologize for Crook and Weston. I should never skip Crook and Weston. Niobrara. So you can see that a large number of our counties have these primary care HPSAs. And dental care, I think, is next. Nope, mental health. There's the picture. You saw, I already said, 23 out of 23 counties, but that's really what it looks like right there. So every one of our counties is considered a mental, uh, a mental health shortage area. And so a lot of them have uh, been able to get some additional facilities because of that. Um, Fremont County has additional facilities because they are covered by the IHS, the Indian Health Service as well. Um, so you can see that's, that's kind of a, oof, that's not good. That's not good. So even if we could pay for it, that's what we would face. And here is the dental HPSA. And this one you have to lean again, I'm sorry. Um, but there you can see that there are parts of Park, Hot Springs, Washakie, Fremont, Lincoln, Converse, Weston, Niobrara, Platte, Goshen, and Carbon in Albany County. And speaking as a professor that deals with 18 to 22 year olds, let me tell you, we need kids <laughs> to be going to the dentist and taking care of their teeth at this time in their life, and they're not able to. So um, there aren't enough dentists in, in many of the parts, many of the many parts of these counties. So well, there's okay. There's there's your first happy happy set of slides. 
Um, oh wait, medically underserved populations. Okay, so these are the counties or parts of counties that have medically underserved populations. Hot Springs, Fremont, Bighorn, um, Crook, Niobrara, parts of Albany County, and that, if you've been to Albany County, that is the, that is the rural northern part. So it's mostly ranch land there. And then parts of Goshen County. So there are some, some really chronic areas of underserved populations. You can see there's a really big problem here in the Native American area as well. So, so now that I've depressed you with now we don't have enough doctors, now what if we could pay for it? <laughs> How would we do that and who would we need to be covering? So um, who, where are Wyoming's uninsured? And again, this is a leaning kind of graph. I apologize for that. The, um, the, the numbers here, uh, the dark red up here, over here in your, your county, that is the percentage of the total population with no health insurance in 2009. So that's 20 to 25% uninsured in this county. The lighter red, that is 18 to 25% uninsured, and then the the blue colors there, the light blue, which is the rest of the state, is 12 to 18 percent uninsured. So it varies a great deal by county. So in the lower uninsured areas, it's 12 to 18 percent. In the higher, the highest uninsured, it's more than 25 percent of the population. Okay, that one's a little sharper. Um, where, let's see, these, this is the percentage of the population below 200 percent of the federal poverty that's uninsured. And you can see that's really where the biggest portion of the problem is. Um, almost all of the, blue, the light blue counties that had the lower numbers of uninsured are suddenly darker. Um, and the dark means that 30% or more of your population that lives at 200% or below of the federal poverty level have, uh, have no insurance. The darker brown is 20 to 30%. So you can see that every county in the state has um, that problem either 20% uh, 20, 20 or above of their population that lives at 200% or below the poverty line doesn't have insurance, no insurance at all, no Medicaid, no nothing. This is the percent of the total population that's covered by public health insurance. And um, breaking it down by counties again, Fremont County has uh, the biggest piece there, and that is because of the Indian Health Service. That's considered public insurance. This guy down here, that's Laramie County, that's where Cheyenne is. So between the Department of Defense and the state of Wyoming, those are both considered public health insurance programs, that's a very high insurance rate for public insurance as well. So those two are very high partially because of specific programs. That they also include populations that are on Medicaid or what's called uh, S-CHIP, which is our state children's insurance program, which is Medicaid for kids. So you can see that's a pretty big piece of Wyoming that has a lot of folks on public insurance as well. And uh, the two that are the highest, of course, have slightly different populations. This is the percent of our population that are insured by private insurance. So the darker that number is, the more over 61% it is. So 61% of Teton County um, who is, has private insurance. Um, Natrona County as well, Sweetwater uh, and Carbon, part of Carbon at least, Albany, uh, Uinta, Natrona, Converse, Campbell. And then the lighter green ones are 54 to 61%. And the very lightest green one there, less than 47%, that is in, um, that is in our, uh, our uh, uh, Fremont County. And then white is they either don't have enough data or nobody. So it's probably most likely that they don't have enough data. This is the percentage of full-time workers, full-time workers who actually have full-time jobs with no insurance. And so... Um, here you can see the darkest green counties, those have 17% or more of their full-time workers don't have any health insurance, including they're not on Medicaid. The lighter, lighter but still dark green is 12 to 17%, and then the lightest green is 9 to 12%. Um, and then the, the ones that are white are either none or there's probably just not enough data because there aren't, there aren't enough of us in those counties. I'm going to skip that one. So... 
All right, so that's where people are and how they're insured. And this is kind of the part where I want to get across to you why. <laughs> not, only, uh, not only are we sparsely populated and so on, but this is some, these are some, some numbers that I've pulled in from different sources over time. Just kind of get a sense of what do, if you're going to be on employer-sponsored employer insurance, you probably have to work in a firm of more than 50 employees. That's just by the numbers. It tends to be that way. Smaller employers um, would love to be able to offer such benefits, but oftentimes can't afford to. They can't afford the premiums. Because they're so, they have such a small number of employees, they can't spread the risk across their pool. So they have a more difficult time offering that benefit. And here kind of helps you understand why that is. This is the, the top numbers are all number of establishments across the state. But essentially, that's the number of establishments by firm size in Wyoming and then comparing them to the United States. 81% of our firms have less than 50 employees compared to about 75% uh, in the United States. So the economy of this state is dominated by very small employers. And a lot of people go, wait, what about in Canada and things like that? Well, yeah, they're down here too, but they're down here. They're in this part. So we have lower than average large firms and we have much higher than average small firms. So that's the number of establishments. That gives you a sense of where people can get employer-sponsored insurance. And the answer is it's less likely in this state to get that because people who own firms of less than 50 employees often find it difficult to offer insurance. Not that they don't want to, but it's simply more difficult for them to. Um, here's another one. Private sector establishments that offer health insurance by firm size. Here you can see, this just gets back to the argument I was just making. In firms of less than 40, or sorry, 50 employees, 28.5% of employers offer private insurance to their employees versus the United States average of 41%. Again, it's more difficult for a small employer to do it, and it's even more difficult in Wyoming because the pool size tends to be even smaller. Those firms tend to be even smaller. Um, in firms of more than 50 employees, you can see that 91%, almost 92% of our employers that are larger offer health insurance benefits. And again, it comes down to not um, uh, uh, any other motivation other than can I afford to do this for my employees? And you can see the answer for many small employers is no. They simply can't. So how do the numbers break down in Wyoming of the insured and how they're covered? Y'all look so, oh my gosh, I can't believe. I'm either really depressing you or you're asleep. Which one is it? <laughs> or you're really cold too. So I'm trying to, re oh, should I slow down? I'll slow down. Okay, read fast. This one we'll leave up for a second because these are some really interesting numbers too. What these represent is from a whole bunch of different sources how our insurance coverage breaks down. So we have about, about 90,000 uninsured, and we'll look at them in a bit. But these are the people that are insured in Wyoming, so I want to talk a little bit about them. So the number of insured in Wyoming, at least as of, these are all from 2009, 2010, so they're a little bit old. But under 65, about 84% of our total population, you saw how much that varies across the counties, but on average, 84.2% um, of, of, of our population under 65 is covered. Um, over 65, covered by insurance, don't be surprised by that, that's Medicare, right? That's, that's what it's for. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> yay, that's good. Under 18, um, we have about 90% coverage um, and under 65 total, 81.9%. But the under 18, that's a very large number because A, parents can keep their, their um, kids on their insurance, and B, we have a very strong program called Kids Care, Kid Care S-CHIP, which is the state children's insurance program. Again, Medicaid for children. So that's the, that's the overall picture of insurance. How does it break down? Well, private insurance, um, you can see there that about almost 70% of our population is covered by um, private health insurance in Wyoming. Um, and, and that breaks down, here's the breakdown between those who work for somebody else and those who work for themselves. So those who work for somebody else, uh, under 65 in the population, about 61.2% of us have employer-based insurance or employer-sponsored insurance. For those who work for themselves, 
about 30% have insurance that they, that's considered own employment based. So it's their own and they're purchasing it on their own. Um, usually for themselves and their employees, but sometimes just for themselves and their family, depending on their circumstances. So um, you can see that it's a fairly substantial number of the insured in Wyoming that are covered by employer-based insurance, even though we have such a predominance of small firms who can't offer as much. Um, and so that, let's go to the next one. Let's look at where else people are getting their insurance. If you don't get it on the private market and you don't go uninsured, your other option is to get government-sponsored health insurance. Now again, some of this is Indian Health Service, but some of this is Medicaid, some of this is Medicare, and there are people that are covered by mixes. So that's always kind of interesting to look at, I think. So if you look at totally who is covered by government health insurance, about 150,000 of us. That includes military, Indian Health Service, Medicare, Medicaid and kid care help to, uh, S chip. So that's a fairly hefty number. Of that 150,000, about uh, 59,000 are covered only by Medicaid. And so that comes down to about 11% of the population. Um, if you're looking at those who are covered both by Medicaid and private insurance, because you can be covered by both, that's not a large number, but it's 18,000, so about 3.2% of Wyoming's population. And you can see that the predominance of them are under 18. There you go. So they're covered both by their folks insurance, but by supplementary insurance on the Kid Care S CHIP program. Um, those who are covered by Medicare, uh, that's about 73,000 of Wyomingites, about 13.5%. There are those who are covered both by Medicare and private insurance, and that comes down to about 39,000. Um, there are those that are covered both by Medicare and Medicaid, and that's a much smaller number, and that's about 7,000. And that's equally kind of almost equally split between under 65 and over 65. 3,000 of those are under 65, 4,000 of those are over 65. And so those who are under 65, these tend to be, um, they have a disability or some job-related injury that has caused that. If you're over 65, this is the... Um, wonderful labyrinth of you have to spend every dime you have in order to, you know, start using Medicaid after you're on Medicare. So you have to basically bankrupt yourself to be one of those 4,000. Don't hope for that, all right? <laughs> Please don't. Please don't. Um, now, so those, that's, those are the insured. Those are the people who have some form of insurance, private or public. These are the uninsured, and this is just a breakdown of that. Um, about 85, well, these are, these are again from 2009. So the number now is actually 90,000, all right? So this is a little bit out of date. None of them are over 65. The vast majority of them are under 65, and some of them are under 18, all right? So they have no insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, employer-sponsored, Indian health, veterans, military, none, okay? So th they've either chosen to do that or there's some other reason for it, okay? So this is the, this is the group that ever, this ever concerns a lot of people, right? And so when we were looking, uh, when we, not we, not that I had anything to do with it, but when insurance reform was being di discussed, um, that was kind of the population that most people were worried about. And in our state, those people have no insurance and have potentially very limited access to health care as it is. So separating out those two issues can be kind of tricky for the state, but that's something we need to think about. There has been a lot of yelling about this, the Affordable Care Act, which is officially called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, um, ACA, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, whatever your political persuasion is, there it is. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is how do we cover the uninsured? Um, some people said we should have a single-payer system. Some people said that we should just leave it alone. Some people said we should do something that had an individual mandate that followed um, the outlines of a couple of other programs that had been proposed in the past. And so kind of a hodgepodge of all those things got put into a mixer and out popped this, all right? And so, so out popped the Affordable Care Act. 
The biggest challenge to me, though, I'm going to keep, keep coming back to saying this before anybody starts getting, ah, we're going to talk about that. There'll be people yelling. Please don't yell at me. I'm just going to show you an analysis, all right? No policy prescriptions. Uh, but the thing that I think is most important for us to remember is that in Wyoming, the biggest problem we have is not paying for insurance. That's a problem, obviously. That's a lot of people without insurance. But to me, the bigger problem is that the vast majority of us have a hard time getting healthcare access, access to healthcare. Not paying for it, getting to a doctor. So important to me at least. So let's talk a little bit about these. Um, well, I think I've already said that this is, this is not a, a really a market. It's a patchwork of systems that we've worked up over the years um, with employer-sponsored insurance and then um, a couple of public programs piled on top of that and we have county, uh, county health care systems, and Wyoming, I used to be on the board of our county public uh, hospital, so I had some experience with that. We have private systems for health care. We have all sorts of different models, right? We have little tiny firms, little tiny uh, physician firms that uh, practice on their own. There, there's this giant network, patchwork of systems of insurance and of provision. Um, and insurance in health is not like insurance in anything else. Like, why do you get house insurance? Why does anybody get health? house insurance or car insurance or any of those kind of things? What do you do that for? Yeah, like a catastrophic loss, an accident, right? Something that may or may not ever happen, but you know, it, you can get your car fixed or your house can be rebuilt at least sometime down the line. Um, once the insurance company pays you. But why do we get health insurance? Same reason, okay, so there are catastrophic reasons to insure yourself against um, massive outlays that may have to be incurred. And everybody dies when your auto gets That's right. That is the biggest difference. In those other cases, we don't, there's no certainty that a car is going to get into an accident. There's no certainty that your house is going to flood or that it's going to burn down in a forest fire. But there is certainty <laughs> that you will get sick and there is certainty that you're going to die. And much as we don't like to, <laughs> I, of course, am never going to die. But, um, but I, I'm reasonably certain that there's probably a good chance that I will someday, right? So the, difference, so, so the difference is that you are insuring against a bunch of very, very uncertain and yet sure to happen things, right? And so you're trying to insure yourself basically against, in catastrophic cases, against bankruptcy. So having a massive heart attack, having a giant accident, those things are very expensive and you don't want to go bankrupt when you do it. So that's one reason you buy health insurance. But you also buy it for all the little things that may happen and preventative reasons and going and getting your physical so you can play hockey and whatever else, right? There's a patchwork of reasons why we buy health insurance. So it's not like all the other things. It's not like the other forms of insurance. It's a little bit different. And so, so we have a market of payments for healthcare, access to healthcare, that's very, very different from any other market we have. And we have um, the good itself of health insurance being very, very different from every other kind of insurance good out there. I mean, actuarially, insurance is usually based on the probability that you will have a you know, house fire, and your house will be destroyed. And based on all these different things, they'll just, you know, here's your rate and pay, pay, your, pay it with your mortgage every month. Um, in insurance on health, it's so much more complex to determine what your premium is going to have to be. And so it's based on your risky behavior, your healthy behavior, how many kids you have, how crazy your spouse drives you. You know, I mean, it's like all these things the insurance company has to figure out, and it's so much more hard for them to do health insurance and to come up with good rates. And so this is one of the reasons I want to point out, just real quick, I know I have to be fast here, but one of the reasons that we really, really have to think about this as such a different good, um, that um, when we look, oh, never mind, I'm going to go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that. We can talk about this all later, too. So I want to show you the three kinds of basic things that are going to happen in next year, well, not next year, two years from now. Um, 
the ACA expands Medicaid to any adult with an income of less than or equal to 133% of, of the federal poverty limit. And that, um, that was the piece of the Supreme Court case that was not um, fully upheld. What they did was they said that if a state choose to participate, chooses to participate in this, they may. But they won't lose all of their Medicaid uh, funding if they don't. Okay? So you can continue on with Medicaid as usual, or you can expand. The federal government will pick up uh, all of the expenditures for the first four years, first five years, excuse me, and then after that it goes to uh, about 95 to 90 to eventually I think 90 is the, the bottom sh cost share with the federal government. So they pay 90%, we pay 100. The individual mandate, which puts us all, okay, I'm gonna talk about this. Why is it so, why, okay, so these guys have this really difficult time setting premiums and selling this stuff because it, you can kind of say, all right, you all live in Jackson, there's a forest out there, the likelihood of a fire getting your house, if you live right at the edge of the forest, may be higher than someone living in, say, Chicago, right? Am I not, is this not correct? A forest fire, not just any old fire. So you may have to pay slightly higher fire insurance premiums than people in Chicago. They can look at where you live, the end. With this stuff, they have to look at all these behavioral things about you and your family and where you live, your geography. They have to look at all of these different things. And so instead of just sort of individually figuring out what your premium should be, they try to put you into pools, right? This is why if you don't have insurance and your, your employer doesn't cover you, it's so expensive to buy it because they have no idea about you, you individually. They can't just say, oh, you live in Jackson, everything's fine. Or, oh, you live in Chicago, that's, you know, your car's gonna get stolen. They have to say, I know nothing about you, you're gonna get charged $5,000 a month so I can provide your health care insurance to you, right? The more you can pull people into one place and determine their price together, the lower premiums can be but the less you have that, the more reason they have to jack up your premium, simply because actuarially that's what you need to do to cover potential losses. The other thing that the ACA did was cover employers of greater than 50 employees, um, or basically say they are required to offer a certain amount of health benefits, and employers with less than 50 were exempt. So this is why I think it's important for Wyoming to know that piece. If you have one of those small firms here in Wyoming, you're exempt from this, uh, this fee, this fine that um, the federal government will put on you otherwise. Um, and so these, this piece of health insurance exchange, this was kind of the, this is something in Wyoming that's still a topic. Um, these were included in order to cover both the uninsured and those people who work for firms of less than 50 employees. So all those 90,000 Wyomingites who don't have insurance can go to this thing, they can pool their risk, they can get lower premiums. And those who have smaller firms can send their employees to this and they can get health insurance at lower rates because they'll be pooled in with everybody else who didn't have insurance before. At least that's the idea. You can run it in a state, you can have a regional entity or the feds can run it for you. And I'm gonna go Skipping forward to what we did here. Ah, there we go. Um, to look at health insurance exchanges, um, there was a, a committee, a steering committee that was put into place under Governor Friedenthal, continued under Meade. We, had four, we have four legislators that are on the committee that run it, Senators Landon and Doc Stetter and Representatives Harvey, Harvey and Kasparik. And then there are 15 members appointed by the governor mostly uh, private uh, consumer advocates, insurance folks, and various other people. And this was begun in 2010 and worked on fact gathering for how to structure the exchange um, until last spring. The legislature directed them to stop until the Supreme Court ruling came in. Unfortunately, that, um, that didn't leave them much time to come up with how to run our exchange. Um, where our uninsured and our small business employees can go and, and try to purchase health insurance. So it's very likely that Wyoming will not have its own exchange. We did some exploration uh, for this commit. I, I work with a guy named Kem Kruger. He's in our School of Pharmacy, and we did some of the baseline numbers for these guys to tell them what 
the insurance exchange might look like, the numbers and this kind of thing. And um, most of the other places that we could potentially have pooled with at that time have already pooled with other people, unfortunately. And they also looked at trying to pair up with places like Utah, which already had an exchange before this. Um, and we have, a, we have a, a higher risk population than most people are comfortable with bringing in to our, into their pools. So it's probably going to be a federally run program. So I know I'm out of time, aren't I? Am I out of time? Uh, Okay. All right. So what we did was we looked at, um, for this, uh, this task force, we looked at the size and composition of the exchange for them so they could figure out whether we could run our own. Um, if it was too small, we were going to need to join other states. And if it was, too lar or if it was uh, large enough, we could probably have our own. So we had nearly 90,000 uninsured, and we have about another 90,000 that work for the, the other classification that would go into the exchange, small business employees. So would that be big enough for an insurance company? So what we wanted to do is figure out how many people would end up in that exchange and whether that would be attractive to an insurance company. So the way we did this was we took a whole bunch of pots and we put people into different pots. So some people were going to be in Medicaid and Kid Care S-CHIP. Some were going to be in this other category, which wouldn't move around. Medicare covers people who are over 65, AHS, military. Those are specific populations. So we were going to have people moving around between the exchange, employer-sponsored insurance, and the uninsured, and then the Medicaid program. And what we wanted to do was figure out, was this going to be a large enough population, and we use this thing called micro simulation. And this basically takes a whole bunch of wacko policy changes in a big legal document and tries to boil them down to what we consider a price change. <laughs> okay, I'm an economist, we look at markets, give me a price, people. Lawyers, be quiet, tell me what the price is. And these things are based on, these models are based on evidence from what we've seen in the past from smaller scale policy changes. So we did this micro simulation model, and this is, I'll show you what we found. Hmm. That's just a bunch of description. So we would start off with nobody in the exchange until next year when it has to come online. And um, between us and the RAND Corporation, who also ran a simulation, we found that probably between 50 and 75,000 people would end up in the exchange. And that would be both the uninsured and those who are in working in, in small firms. And um, is that big enough? We don't know, unfortunately. But you'll notice that that is not all of the uninsured plus all of the small business <laughs> employees, right? That would be 100 and, you know, that would be 180,000 people. We're finding that it's much smaller than that. Um, how would Medicaid change? Um, and this was another big question. What would happen if Medicaid expanded? Um, and we found an enrollment probably in Medicaid going up from about 80,000 now to over 120,000 uh, towards the end of this decade. Whether that's, uh, and that's actually in line with most other estimates that have come out since. Um, those who would go into employer sponsored insurance would roughly go up by about 100,000 from 300,000 or so in Wyoming Heights now to 400,000, 450 roughly. And we found that the population of the uninsured would go from um, up here at around the, well, here somehow that calibration went off a little bit, but we found that it would fall to under 20,000 by the end of the decade. And the RAND Corporation found that it would be about 40,000. Um, status quo with no reform, we found that the uninsured population would go up to uh, over 100,000. So it would be much higher. Um, so, I think I'm going to stop there and uh, say questions. Are there questions? I have, if anybody wants me to send these slides, what I have here, too, are the estimates of how much it would cost Wyoming to do the Medicaid expansion. So, here, which is the very fun part. <laughs> yes? very difficult to tell at this point. 
And um, when Governor Mead says in his news conferences that he doesn't have many details, many times that's exactly what he's referring to. How would the federal exchange program work? How would it be administered? Who, would we have someone in the mix in the administration of it? Um, when he talks about, I don't have enough information, it's not this information he's lacking, it's the information on the alternative, which is the federal exchange. Um, I believe that they are hoping, that the HHS folks have been saying they're hopeful that they would have, uh, they would have people in the state running it on behalf of the federal government. So it would be, it would be that. But culturally, this has been not a very happy pill to swallow. I remember Representative Harvey being particularly unhappy about the potential of <laughs> the federal government running it for the very reason that we have these other challenges that maybe they're not so aware of when it comes to our provision of health care in general, too. So there aren't a lot of details on that at this point. So I saw, I'm sorry, I'll see, yes. <laughs> Wyoming's population puts us in a risky category. Uh, um, a good number, and it depends on the county greatly, but a good number of those uninsured um, that work particularly in Campbell, Sublette, and Sweetwater County work in um, industries where injury rates are very high. And so they're more industrial, uh, or mining, let me just say that. They're extractive. Um, so a good portion of those who work in bigger firms, those are bigger firms too, and some of them, Sweetwater County is anomalous. It has a lot of those types types of workers in insurance programs with their employers, but they're the anomaly. Um, in addition, we also have a lot of the uninsured are agricultural, self-employed, um, and, and the like. Um, some of it's a perception problem, though, because a lot of our unemployed work at computer, or uninsured, excuse me, work at computers all day and are not terribly risky. But the perception of the risk comes from the heavy industry extractive. Yes, ma'am. If uh, Wyoming were to go into a federal exchange, would the Wyoming risk pool be differentiated from other states' risk pools that went into a federal exchange? Or would it be one big mass? We would be massed. And that was why it was, tr it was attractive to us uh, in many ways when we were doing the modeling to look at uh, similarly situated states that had um, maybe about the same risk profile, but that um, if it was a larger population would attract enough insurance companies. And so, um, but yeah, it would, we would be pooled with everybody else as far as the, the costs went. And so the, pr the uh, premiums, there we go, would be lower. Yes. Uh, I really don't understand uh, who administers these things. Is, for example, would Wyoming turned over to a private corporation, <coughs> say Blue Cross Blue Sheet, who knows about uh, health care in Wyoming? Or would it be turned over to a federal agency like uh, HHS uh, or something? HHS, which runs uh, social, or not social Security, Medicare, and they should know about health care in Wyoming because We've got a lot of old people who are already on it. Now, is it going to be turned over to a private corporation or will it be operated by a knowledgeable uh, government entity or will Wyoming set up its own administration? So there are a couple of ways to answer that. One is that the, I, the way the law was written, the administration should be done by a um, private nonprofit firm. And so it should be somebody, in, in, so, so that's if you decide not to run it in, inside, your ex, in, inside your existing government structure. We could put it within one of our, say, the insurance commissioner's office. I don't necessarily think that's where it would go, but you could put it inside an existing government agency and have someone administer it there. Alternatively, you can have a private nonprofit administer it for you. Um, as time has gone on, I've heard other ideas that potentially it could be the, the case that you do something like, for example, the state of Wyoming, we're self-insured. We don't have an insurance uh, company running a, our stuff, but we have an administrator that runs the plan, and that's Cigna. Um, could be something like that. If the federal government does it, that's another one of those questions that we don't know necessarily the answer to at this point. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Yes. A question. You said you had projected costs to the state, and we don't have that slide. But the range that I read in the paper is Carry on. 30 or 50 million up to over 150 million. How, how can you have that much gap in the projected estimate of costs to the state? Ah, uh, the biggest difference here, and I'll, I just put up the the numbers from the one of the estimates. There were two studies that came that did this. This is the Millman report. And the reason that there's so much variability there um, is that the state share here is shown to be 53 to 310 or 311 million dollars over the course of five years or six years uh, is because there are people that may come out of the woodwork. Um, they call them woodworkers, woodwork people. Um, <laughs> I think they're actually up there, Woodward population, I love that, um, that, that are eligible for Medicaid right now, even under current guidelines, and would then come out uh, as the guidelines were upped from 100% of federal to 133% of federal poverty. Um, so there are those folks. There are new adults that would come in. There would be newly eligible children that would come in, and um, we're not sure how many private employers would kick their folks over to exchanges or tell them to go to Medicaid. And that's very possible, um, that it may be just more economical for them to say, we're not going to have a, an insurance program anymore. You go get it either at the exchange or go to Medicaid. And so the low estimates tend to be the folks who are coming out of the woodwork and the newly expanded required populations. Um, that's a low enrollment estimate. And the high enrollment estimate takes into account the fact that there could be some private employers that shut down their health benefit policy. So. But the, the gap for the best estimate is 116 to 148. So why is the number that's published or made public from 50 to 310? Oh, oh, so what they're doing there is they're taking the low enrollment 53.3, the low estimate, and the, lo the very highest estimate for high enrollment. So they're taking the two giant, giant swings there. What's wrong with the testing? Oh, nothing's wrong with that. They're just being cautious. We, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to draw this to a close. We are going to have a roundtable discussion, and you can bring your questions and ask Ann uh, at that point. And it's accompanied by a free lunch. So there is a free lunch. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're running a little bit late, so let's just take 10 minutes and come back here at 11.30.